Hello, uh, everyone. We are back for one final live stream for today's Giving Tuesday um, distributed telethon. I am joined this evening by Avani Gadani. She is another Aslan Fellow from the San Francisco chapter joining us for this final segment. Um, and she is going to tell us a little bit about Victorian mourning jewelry. Um, but before we get there, I wanted to do a couple things. The first thing is, is I wanted to ask you, Avani, how did you first discover, what, what brought you to a fascination with Victorian morning jewelry? Um, well, during the pandemic, I started learning how to make jewelry in general. And over the last couple months, I've been really interested in learning how uh, Victorians made morning jewelry because some of the techniques they used were very specialized for the materials they had and some of the constraints they had. So I'll talk about it in the talk. So it's just a neat, oh. it's a neat problem. Well, that, that leads to the second question, which I was gonna ask, which is what is something weird that you learned during the pandemic? And you already said jewelry making. So is there, <laughs> is there another thing? Hmm, let's see. I never really learned how to make bread properly, but I did learn how to pickle my own herring. So I'll call that a bad even. Yeah, I couldn't do the bread thing either. I, uh, Azolda gave me a starter. I, I, I just couldn't make it work. I couldn't do it. I can't keep baby sour yeah. alive. Yeah. Okay. So I have a little uh, starter grave too. Um, everyone on fundraiser news, we are just under fourteen thousand um, dollars. We are really hoping to close down this evening at fifteen thousand dollars. So if you have are st have stuck with us through the whole day and you are, have not yet donated and you're in a position to do so, now would be a really terrific time to help us round out the evening and hit our goal for today. Um, the Donate link is at the bottom. It is bit.ly forward slash odd giving. Um, any amount, you can pencil in anything you like. Anything that's over $100 brings you annual membership, which comes with a whole bunch of perks. So um, you can you can follow the link. Uh, it's all over the Facebooks. It's on all the YouTube videos. Um, and we'll bring it back up at the end of the video. So now I'm going to hand things over to Avani to talk a little bit about morning jewelry. All right. Well, uh, good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are, uh, everybody. Uh, so tonight, I'm just going to quickly talk about some fun, fun facts about Victorian morning jewelry. So Victorian morning jewelry is, of course, set by Victoria. Victoria was both the namesake and the linchpin and the complete, you know, basically like the person who made the Victorian age happen, right? So Victoria's husband, Albert, died very young, very early. He died at 42. And after that, um, her fashion sense kind of, you know, went to pot. She was in mourning for the rest of her life. And she lived until her 80s. And so the rest of her life was a long time. But during that time, she still had a penchant for jewels. And so during that time, she had hundreds of pieces made to commemorate both Albert, like this uh, morning ring, this cameo ring, um, as well as other family members, including um, her children, her parents, and other long lost relatives. And in doing so, she set a trend. And so from there, Victorian morning jewelry became a commercial success throughout England because Victorians took their morning very, very, very seriously. So when uh, a relative died, whether it was say, a partner or a parent, a woman had to be in deep mourning for a year and a day. So this meant that all of the shutters in the house had to be closed. It meant that the mirrors had to be covered so that the deceased soul wouldn't escape back in. It meant that the woman couldn't wear any color or any ornamentation other than after that year and a half, a little bit of white at the cuffs. It also meant that a woman couldn't wear any jewelry that had any bling to it uh, for that first year and a half. After that year and a half, things loosened up a little bit. By year two, you could wear shiny black. By year three, you could add in a little bit of pearls, a little bit of white, you know, kind of still reserved, very, very classy and elegant. And then by like four or five, um, you could maybe start getting crazy and adding a little bit of like, you know, blue back into your wardrobe. Um, men had to wear armbands every now and then. Black hats, black gloves, gloves maybe armbands. Victorian England. Um, 
they uh, in part, you know, because of this, the uh, industry again became very, very active. Uh, people died a lot in Victorian times, and so death was normalized. And um, you had a life expectancy around your 30s, right? So like one in three children died, and they constantly were in mourning. So there was a huge industry around creating a lot of these black clothes and very, very simple black jewelry. So you might have heard the term jet black before. This was popularized in the Victorian era, era because they used jet to make their black. Um, so they didn't want anything showy, right? You don't want any shimmer, any ostentation, partly because you want to be formal, partly because there was a thought that anything reflective, like a mirror, could also invite back in the soul, but soul of the deceased. And you don't want that. Um, Victorians believed in ghosts. And they did not want to entice a ghost or a spirit back into their space. And so their jewelry by uh, nature was not. Um, so they decided that they still wanted jewelry. And so they decided to find some fancy coal. Victorians had fancy coal. And they used this fancy coal called jet to carve um, very, very delicate cameos. So the nice thing about Jet, um, working with Jet, is that it's very, very soft. And so you can make very high detail pieces. Um, the annoying thing about Jet is that it's very, very soft. And so as you make these high detail pieces, it's very easy to chip them away. But that's an entirely different talk on um, rock mechanics. Um, Victorian morning jewelry also end up using a lot of post-mortem photography. Um, there are various pictures on this slide because uh, looking for Victorian postmortem photography is kind of harrowing. I do not recommend this if you have children. Uh, so remember that the child mortality rate, uh, as I said a few minutes ago, is around one in three, which meant that for many children, the only photograph taken of them was after death. And Victorians, again, they had a much more, I would say, accepting um, relationship with death than we do. And so it was not nearly as grisly as we think of it today to take a picture of your dead kid and stick it in a locket and wear it around forever. Um, it's not easy to look at though. Uh, so there was a um, burgeoning trade in postmortem photography to the point where the majority of photographs taken in Victorian time were done after death. Um, so they did do cameos, but photography was seen as kind of a fancy, you know, new wave way to go. And then finally, my favorite thing about Victorian morning jewelry was that Victorians were really, really into hair. Um, so the defining feature of Victorian morning jewelry is hair work. Um, so the hair work can be something as simple as taking a piece of hair and curling it around and gluing it down. Um, so what you do here is you just take a little bit of watered down glue and you can paint over some hair and get it to go into a reasonable shape. Um, up to doing a fancy scene, and you can see some gorgeously detailed scenes done with like individual bits of hair that you put down with tweezers onto a um, kind of you know tacky surface. And um, so you can see this uh, painting on the right, a uh, piece of jewelry on the right, where you have a single person's hair down in this weeping willow um, type of motif. A willow is again being another symbol of death and of remembrance. But you can make even make that hair structural. So there was a trend uh, for a while during Victorian times of making hair jewelry that was the structural element of bracelets and necklaces. And so you would take hair, you would dip it in a shellac light glue. It wasn't actually a shellac. Um, and then you would braid it and twist it. And you could use that to make these structural elements. And um, there was one tiny issue with this, right? So many of these went in this day, there was lots and lots of hair jewelry. In fact, um, it was very common when you died to leave money in your will so that people could have jewelry of you, right? So you didn't you know, order jewelry of somebody who died typically, typically it showed up in your mailbox, right? So, you know, cousin Ed died and all of a sudden there was, a block of their hair in a little ring and with a little note next to it um, showing up you know, by telegram. So that's a lot of hair. Uh, they ran out of hair. So uh, typically like you shave the back of the deceased head, but 
there was such a demand that during the peak, uh, Victorian England was importing 50 tons of hair every year so that they can make hair jewelry so that people could send out these tokens to the to their uh, loved ones after they passed. And so that is a very brief introduction to Victorian hair jewelry and morning jewelry. And um, normally at this point, we would make a toast to something about the Victorian era, Victorian morning. Um, I would like to instead make a toast to Absalon. So Absalon has been doing amazing work during the pandemic trying to maintain this community despite the fact that we haven't been able to do live events. And so please, you know, give give to the fundraiser and help us keep doing this for the next year and many more years to come. So take care and good night, everybody. Cheers. Thank you, Avani. Um, I have one question for you before we let you go. Uh, so you said that you've been dabbling in jewelry making since you started the pandemic. Have you taken on the hair, the hair weaving, the yes. hair braiding? Yes, yeah, so I've been, it tangles, it tangles a lot. I would think. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it and it takes a lot of hair to do some of these things. So I have, you know, pieces that are this big, you can't see the screen, there's my camera, there we go, this big, um, to do like a simple braidwork piece. And yeah, I was going to try to do some show and tell, but nothing is quite finished enough. Okay, um, well, but it's It's fun. If you have something ready by, by odd mints, you should definitely bring it out. I would love to see it. I would. Yeah, awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, thank you everyone who's tuned in today for this whole series. Um, thank you to Trey, who's burning the midnight oil to drive this thing from, from her houseboat. And thank you to all of tonight's presenters and speakers um, for joining us from both coasts, uh, both of our chapters in New York and in San Francisco to bring a few stories to tonight's stage. Um, I think that this is it for the day. Um, I'm really, really, really grateful and honored to have so many people participate today, uh, both on the front side and on the back end. It truly, truly does take a whole community to make this project go. And we wouldn't have it any other way because we have the best people. So cheers and thank you all for joining us. <laughs>